Hey there everybody, thanks for joining me for another one man review. Today I'll be taking a look at the new Fanagraphics Underground release, My Fairy Godfather from Robert Mailer Anderson and John Sack. I mentioned specifically that this is a Fanagraphics Underground release because uh, this is one of the most mainstream looking books I've seen from Fanagraphics in a really, really long time, or at least that I've read. The art style is something I actually, I both dislike and like quite a bit. Um, I, I think that there, we'll flip to this page, there's a middle ground here between like photorealistic comics and Chris Ware, I think, is like what the artist John Sack is stylistically aiming for. And there's part of me that really, really likes that because there was a long time that I spent chasing something kind of like this because I really like things that are drawn really realistically, but I really like the flat colors and the kind of stripped down approach like this panel here with the orthographic perspective and stuff that looks a lot like a Chris Ware. So this is an artist doing something that I spent a long time trying to do um, or even like this John Wayne here, the way that everything's broken down with uh, really solid flat colors. You can see that on, on the cover as well. And we'll take a closer look at this image on the inside. But where everything's made out of flat kind of cell shading styles, it's all stuff I used to really, really like. It's stuff that taste-wise, I feel like now I'm interested in other things. And this stuff looks a little bit less sophisticated to me because it's that such a weird combination of... It's a stiff combination of things. But within that, I still like the design aesthetic of it all. And I really think that the stiffness, you know, does the, lend itself to, like, this um, very boring view of reality, I guess. And that works very well for this story. So that that's kind of how I feel about the art is I think they've accomplished something that I really, really wanted to do for a long time. Um, and you know, I think it works very well for the story, but from where I'm at as an artist, I don't find it as exciting or compelling as I would have maybe even four or five years ago. Um, so story wise, what the story is all about is we're with this character, Billy, her parents have just died in a car crash, and this is her aunt and uncle who are taking her from Austin, Texas to uh, liberal Kansas to drop her off with her like parents' best friend, who is her godfather. And that's where you get the My Fairy Godfather. And the godfather uh, is gay and has a partner, and so that's where you get the fairy from. It's pretty obvious like this is the opening spread of the book here where you got them with their big old Texas truck um, driving through America. And on the radio you have uh, the first bit of dialogue is someone on the radio saying, the Supreme Court rightly concluded that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission failed to show tolerance and respect for Mr. Phillips' religious beliefs. He, sh he should not have to bake a gay cake. Um, so immediately with that bit of writing and the italics on rightly, you know, basically emphasizing the rightly and you can tell it's being emphasized in a sarcastic way, really quickly I got my guard up about what type of book it is. There's, there's been one time um, in the book Rasalka where something was said very early and that didn't pay off to be what the vibe of the book was over time. It was kind of intentionally misleading. So I was like, okay, I'm going to give it a chance and I'm going to read it all the way through. Um, but that kind of arrogant self-assuredness about your view on the world it, it, and unable to think critically outside of that is basically, I think, the core of the writing of this book is it's a very flattened view of the world that only has one side and any character that falls outside of the writer's very obvious worldview is flattened down to a cardboard cutout presented in a negative light and treated with no empathy or sympathy, which is exactly what the book is asking people to do is to think empathetically and sympathetically with the characters that align with the, the writer's view of things. 
Um, there's a lot of stuff that I agree with with the writer. Like, if people want to be gay, they should be able to be gay and marry whoever they want. And, you know, everyone should leave them alone, stay out of, stay out of people's business. Uh, but I actually disagree with this writer on this issue of the Supreme Court. I don't think a cultural producer, a artist, a cake baker, whatever, should be forced under any circumstance to produce something for a customer they don't want. Whether or not that refusal is based in an ignorant bias or not doesn't change the fact that legally I'm very uncomfortable with people being able to force a creative individual into working for someone they don't want to. So for this, and that has nothing to do with my feelings on gay rights. Like I think gay marriage should be legal. I cried when I saw Obama light the rainbow flag across the White House, you know, like there's, so we're in agreement about the end goal, but I am 100 vehemently in disagreement with this writer's very obvious position on uh, a Supreme Court issue that, you know, should have never even reached the Supreme Court. Um, you know, if it's not providing medical care to someone because they're sexual identity or whatever, then that's a problem. But denying someone a cake, denying that I'm going to do a book for someone or paint a painting for someone's a different issue. That's di divorced, you know, has nothing to do with gayness or not. That's just, uh, so that's my opinion on that topic. Um, and I don't think it's fair for this writer to treat it as an, a, like such an obvious bad argument, such an obvious bad choice on the Supreme Court that the first thing that they're going to do in their book is make fun of it as like, you'd have to be an ignorant idiot to think that they got that wrong. Well, I'm sorry. I have a degree in philosophy from UC Berkeley. Uh, I disagree with you from a philosophical and logical standpoint. So right away, there is a smugness and an arrogance in this book that's right up front. And it's, it's very hard to deal with. So the, the uh, story then goes, you see that we're going to liberal Kansas because of course we need to go to liberal where they have the term that's mighty liberal of you and obviously they aren't liberal because they're in liberal Kansas. Uh, they're, they're dumb, ignorant, conservative, redneck idiots is how the book treats this. Um, Tori grew up in small town Oklahoma and she can attest to the fact that there are plenty of people like the small town conservative bigots that are represented in this book. But that is an unfair, unempathetic, unsympathetic view of everyone who lives in those situations. Now, there are characters within this book and within this town that aren't ignorant, dumb rednecks, but those are all like, oh, they're my friend. That's the sympathetic one. They're very few and the majority of the people are bitter, ugly, nasty, you know, not coastal city people and that's that's where these writers are coming from it's it's very obvious um this is the gay uncle adam and this is his business partner stephen that gives you another look at what i think is the very sophomoric writing in this book uh and there's another point later in the book where they have someone say the god didn't create adam and he created adam and eve not adam and steve and someone gets to rejoin her. So, oh, so clever. They get to rejoin her. Well, her uncles are Adam and Stephen. Da, 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 da. So very sophomoric, you know, comeback there. No actual argumentative logic. Um, just shitty rhetorical strategies, making bad jokes to name the characters. Adam and Steve, you get um, Billy here coming in and she's going to school for the first time of course all the kids are for the most part awful kids there's a couple cool people like clara who's obviously like an outsider and a lesbian that uh billy makes friends with billy herself um even though she's obviously lgbtq friendly and an ally and all of that she's got her little resist patch on her shoulder the frida Kahlo, you know um, she makes, obviously this is a person she makes friends with. There's a little romantic struggle there, but Billy's not actually gay herself. Um, so that's some of the, what there is in the book, but that's pretty much the rest of the story is her 
and her uncles, you know, trying, or not her uncle, but her godfather and his partner trying to get uh, comfortable with being a parent. Um, you know, he's never been a parent. Uncle or godfather Adam, and then her in the small town, and them dealing with the people in the small town and stuff like this. So that's the kind of rest of the structure of the book is just how they live together. There's a lot in the book from the writing standpoint that is interesting when they're dealing with the uh, Adam struggle to raise a kid out of nowhere and her having to adapt. But there's no real depth to that struggle. There's no real depth to his attempts. There are some, you know, those are the better moments of writing than there's him struggling to become a father when he never has. Um, but there's not much in the depths of her writing about like how she's dealing with her parents' death or anything like that. There's not a whole bunch of stuff that that seems to be the core of the book is that, oh, she's moving in with this guy and they've never, but it's obviously not so much about that as it is about the ignorant people around them and how they have to overcome that ignorance and that kind of stuff. Um, so the most compelling personal character driven stuff kind of gets pushed to the side, even though that's more interesting. There are a few moments in the writing where I think the writer actually uses the Stephen character to get some things right. Like here, Stephen is telling Adam, we're not full of prejudice and you don't have to walk on water to be a role model. We're trying to be human in a human world, not saints in heaven. Um, and I think if that would have been the the vibe of like the moral, ethical, out world view presented within the totality of the book, I would think this, this was a really refreshing book. And I kept reading, hoping like, okay, we're only on page 40 and we got a lot of page to go, that there would be something where the main characters would also have a connective moment with the people around them and learn that, you know, there's all these good things about these people too. They have these things that they need to fix about themselves, but see them as like human beings. Like, you know, we are human beings in a human world. We're all broken, we're all trying. And that really doesn't, that thought doesn't extend to the rest of the book in how, in how I read it, at least. In the artwork, there are also some moments where the colors are printed very, very darkly and this is a matte paper. I like the look of the matte paper. I like how the colors in general and the art sits on this paper quite a bit. This um, I'm split on. I really do like images that play with limited range of contrast, like having the windows and the blue stand out in this. But I also have a feeling because this is a computer color book that this looked really awesome on a screen and the artist hasn't like seen enough even though he's had other books in print he hasn't seen it in print enough to understand oh i gotta brighten the colors up a little bit it's not that i can't see where the colors are at it's just that on this paper you and where you don't get the full saturation some of what i assume would have been nice contrasts on the computer don't pop as much here so i'm split on whether i like that or not because sometimes that's how the world is at night too uh, but this feels like the trend in like Marvel and Disney movies and a lot of TV shows I've seen where people are trying to go with accurate, realistic nighttime colors and lighting versus, you know, you go back to the 80s and you see a nighttime scene and it's all like really bright blue and really bright oranges, things like that where you can actually see it. And I think this um, push towards realism maybe goes a little too far sometimes you want to just do something for ease of consumption and you know like having some visual impact and I, I think images like this that's again just my personal feeling on it i do think there are times in my life when i would have liked this more accurate like oh you know there's barely differences between the colors um so that's something i was a little split on about in the book this book also struck me, all of my comments that I write my little notes, these are before I look at author bios or anything like that. Um, so I had noticed throughout the book too that when it came to the children, it felt like an adult writing what they think kids talk like. It didn't feel like a, you know, with the main character being a young girl, uh, 
or you could see that Adam being the main character, maybe, but I still take Billy as the character that we're, we're following the most. We're following her friendships. We're following her evolution in the town. Um, it just feels like written by someone who thinks they know more about youth than they do. I think this expression here is really well drawn, by the way. But uh, if you read these two panels here, you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. I know it's totally sus bringing a freshman, let alone him. No worries. Like I said, if Dylan's peeps throw us any shade, we'll just bounce. You're fam. Um, yeah, like some kids use those words. I'm around that age, college age range all the time. I've been around that college age in three different cities in my, my time teaching. Um, those kind of words are more, some of them are more prevalent in other places. Fam would have been more prevalent in like 2015. You know, there's just, they're kind of mixing up the dialogue. It feels, it feels like an old guy trying to, to be cool. So I have some problem with that too. And that's on the characters we're supposed to be sympathetic to are a little bit cardboard in their dialogue as well. Um, in another, here's some art that I wanted to look at because I really like it. I think the coloring on this one works really good. There's enough of the variation in value where everything uh, stands out and I feel like nothing's getting lost in the dark. And then also some really nice stuff going on here with like reflections on the street. And then this image, which is used for the cover, uh, this is obviously a scene from a movie that's playing in her uncle's movie house uh, that actress looks pretty familiar to me i'm but i'm not a big 80s movie guy so i don't know that's like prettier pink and so, something like that molly ringwald or julia whatever her name is um i really like this approach this actually looks like this might have each layer might have been done separately on a physical piece of paper and then scanned in and turned into color with all of the shading and the hatching feathering to make the um, different values there i think this is a really lovely piece and I think the art in the book would actually benefit, like pieces like this that look more like an Adrian Tomini um, piece where they're from a distance and they're a little more simple with the flatter colors, love that look. But I think this book would have benefited from um, this more painterly approach, like the fact that the blacks blend in, there's not so much emphasis on like line work around the characters there's a stranger color palette you know we're, we're not leaning into naturalistic colors like everything in here's pretty naturalistic colors all throughout so visually i see the elements of a much more interesting much more singular style here it just looks like it requires a lot more work to do it so i would love to see john sack do something that utilized whatever approach this is with the fuller range of colors, the more steps in between and all of that. Um, visually, I would really, really like that. So that's, you know, I'm trying not to give away too much in terms of actual like plot points as the book goes on, but I wanted to give a general, like what I was thinking while I was reading this book. Um, so then because I was having these questions about who is this person writing this this book with this kind of world view maybe i'm missing something or maybe it is written by a younger person and my views on that would be you know like thrown out the window uh but then you get to the back and it says robert would like to thank my wife nicola minner and my children da 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 da, da. so uh the the writers not even part of the lgbtq community it's obviously not a young girl so then I look at the author bios and try and find out more. Robert Mailer Anderson is a writer, producer, activist, and ninth generation Californio, which is a strange way to identify, like a Californian is what we always called it. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the rest of his, his career. He's been a contributor to the Anderson Valley Advertiser for over 40 years. So age-wise, this is someone who's got to be, if they were contributing as a writer for over 40 years, they got to be late 50s, early 60s. Um, and then he's a board member of Penn Oakland, 
the advisory board of Los Cincentles and was appointed by Governor Gavin Newsom to the California Humanities Board in 2020. So the writer of this book is someone, an old white man, straight, cis, uh, <laughs> and appointed by Governor Newsom, who I can tell you, uh, me and plenty of other people who no longer live in California are happy we don't live under the political regime of Gavin Newsom. Um, this is an involved political player that wrote this book, an older, white, married, straight man who is writing a book. And I'm also not someone to talk about appropriation of stories or you can only write your experience, but every problem I have with the writing in here it was validated by reading that. Uh, as this is someone who's writing not only the characters they disagree with from a smug and arrogant standpoint that shows no sympathy or empathy to try and see the worldview from someone else's point of view, but this person is also writing cardboard characters of the side they associate with because this is not someone who could successfully write a young... This, this person isn't a good enough writer to write outside of their experience that much, which is why he can't write a young girl character that feels right, which is why he names characters Adam and Steve. Um, this is very obviously a political activist person that's far left-leaning progressive, is actually working with the governor of California who has been enacting laws that are absolutely trashing the state. Um, and he's going to open his book with this smug thing, assuming that he is the most right person on the planet and you couldn't disagree with him without being an ignorant idiot. Um, and that's what this book feels like, which is kind of sad and unfair to John Sack because John Sack turns in a pretty great performance, I would say, as an artist. It's a beautiful book to look at. Um, and, you know, looking at John Sack, though, he's also basically he's a uk artist and writer his first book la lucha chronicled the story of human rights defenders in the states of chihuahua mexico so the artist is also pretty much engaged in political activism um but again you know like why are you worried about chihuahua mexico man write about the uk or something uh you know and then his stories have covered syrian refugees in turkey environmental activists in mongolia kazakhstan and peru and the history of oil in iraq uh it's it's just like the viewpoint is too obvious in this book it's too pedantic it's too much on its own one side that said it was like the flow of the story some of the banter between the characters there's moments where the stephen character says other things i liked like it wasn't hard to get through as a read it was enjoyable to look at but the arrogance just oozed off the pages of these things uh, this thing and it was really kind of baffling and um you know it's, it's something else that i thought while i was reading this is i've been reading uh digitally i've been reading omaha the underground comic from the i think the 80s and that book is dealing with these issues in such a more sophisticated way with such more sympathetic characters. You have like gay characters, you have disabled characters, you have this whole range of characters. Uh, and the, none of them are like, they're going out and being bosses and living their life and making things happen. And it just seems like such a better place for stories to be coming from uh, in terms of creating representation for a community than for this. The Eisner nominated The Strange Death of Alex Raymond by Dave Sim and myself. This is a gorgeously illustrated and designed book. Dave doing most of the illustration. Um, amazing compositions throughout. What Dave is doing is he's recording his obsession with the death of master cartoonist Alex Raymond behind the, the wheel of Stan Drake's car when they got into a car crash. The best description of the book that I've heard is that it's like understanding comics with pages like this uh, mixed with something like From Hell when you get into uh, the, the theories about you know what actually happened with the car crash. And then with Sean on production, it's just one of the most gorgeously printed books you could get a hold of.